Welcome everyone to this final in the Henley and Partners Education webinar series, Special Educational Needs and Disabilities. It's my great pleasure as the Head of Global Education for Henley and Partners to welcome you to this final education webinar and for me to welcome some special guests today who are going to talk to you about a range of different difficulties and needs that children across the world face in flourishing within schools. And hopefully today, you'll come away with a better understanding of perhaps how you can enable your child to flourish more in their academic life within school and be successful wherever they end up. The webinar will last roughly around 20, 25 minutes. There is a question and answer channel. So if you do have any questions, please pop them into that channel. And I will ask those questions of our guests today or at the very end of the webinar. So today we are going to be looking at special educational needs. And as you can see from the slide in front of you, Many of you on the webinar today are probably here because you want to know more, not just for your own children, but potentially for your clients' children as well. And one of the difficulties with being an international parent is that it's very difficult to understand how does your child compare? What, if any, options exist internationally for your children? And if they are experiencing difficulties, what can you do to help them? And so hopefully today, we can give you some of those answers. At Henley and Partners, our specialists in special educational needs and disabilities are globally recognized, and they come with significant experience in schools and universities and working directly with families themselves. I'm delighted to welcome onto the webinar today, Charlotte Atkins, who's going to talk in general terms just about autism and specifically ADHD. I'm also delighted to welcome onto the webinar Lucy Wayman, who has a specialism in maths and particularly in screening for dyscalculia. And last but by no means least, Kelly Chalice, who is our dyslexia expert, who is highly qualified not just to screen, but also to assess as well. So on to the questions for our specialists, and we're going to be looking at some of the early signs as well as what does a screener or an actual diagnosis for a special educational need look like. But first up, I just want to ask um, um, our panelists and starting with Kelly, welcome to all three of you. But Kelly, if in just general terms, can you just talk a little bit uh, about what, what would, in dyslexic terms, would some of the early signs um, look like if you were a parent and you were observing your child? What are some of the early signs of dyslexia that you would probably be wanting parents to, to identify and to flag up? Um, hi, hi everyone. Um, so it, that's a really good question. And it's one that, um, I often sort of uh, throw back to parents who will come to me wanting to find out a bit more about dyslexia. Um, and one of the first things I ask is um, when you talk to them, are they able to explain and describe and build really good pictures verbally? But when you ask them to write it down, it's almost as if there's a disconnect disconnect between you know their ideas in their head and what they can get down on paper. That's a really um, a, a really good one. Um, lots of people that have more than one child will see differences. Perhaps it's the older one and the younger ones are catching them up, or it's a younger one who is not perhaps you know meeting those milestones at the same rate as their siblings. So that's another thing that um, a lot of parents kind of look out for. Um, and it's watching out for those you know when they start to become reluctant to do things, to read out loud. Um, they might find it really difficult to um, put a whole word together when you're expecting them to have a, an increased fluency with reading. Um, so it's when you get those questions, those niggling questions in the back of your head and you think, that doesn't feel quite right to me. Um, answers are not coming from school. That's when I would start perhaps looking at, you know, talking to somebody like me about the next steps. 
Okay, Th thank you very much, Kelly. And so that was a really interesting insight into dyslexia. So turning now to Lucy, so the bedfellow to dyslexia in many respects, and that's maths and dyscalculia. Lucy, in similar terms, what would you encourage parents to be looking out for in terms of flags or potential issues? Okay, well, hello, everyone. Um, similar to Kelly, um, it's when children aren't doing as you expect them to do, um, when they're starting to struggle, when their peers aren't struggling. Typical things in maths that are cause, cause problems for children are things like their inability to remember their number bonds to 10. They can't recall facts quickly. Um, they might find that they can count forwards, but they can't count backwards. They forget processes quickly and need to relearn everything right from the beginning every time they start. Um, the time it tends to get flagged up most though is when in a child's life they start learning times tables and a dyscalculic child will often simply not be able to learn their times tables that you could do them over and over again and they just don't get them, they just don't understand the concept of times tables. Um, it may not be picked up early on as children do progress at very different rates. Um, but the maths learning will start unraveling if they have some fundamental issues with maths. So again, it's when you start to think, oh, that's not quite right, or something's not quite as it should be, that's when you know there's a problem. Also, of course, if they stop liking maths and get very anxious about it, which will compound any problems with learning. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Kelly. And so, Charlotte, um, autism obviously is a very big topic and there's quite a large spectrum but just in general terms if you were a parent and you were concerned about your child what what sorts of early indicators might you be encouraging them to look out for uh, hello everyone um you said from autism is a spectrum so um there are a very broad range of sorry to interrupt you charlotte i think your microphone might be covered possibly apologies Okay, if you if you could just shout a little bit louder, that might help then. Sorry. How's that? Is that better? That's better. Perfect. There we go. Um, Ideal. Yeah. So, um, because autism is, is a spectrum, there are a whole range of, of areas where children might struggle with some challenges. Um, but broadly, in um, in a classroom situation in particular, the seek the signs to look out for are children struggling to form friendships or misunderstanding social situations, not being able to function within the group setting, um, inability to follow complex instructions, so perhaps being able to respond to part of an activity but not the whole activity. Um, also, they may, as a, almost a form of managing their anxiety, engage in what may be seen as unusual or a different type of activity, just as a way of trying to control the situation. So they might engage in some sort of ritualistic or aesthetic type behaviour. Um, there's often a strong reliance on routines and structure so that the children feel more comfortable in an environment that can be very confusing and challenging for them. Um, and often, there are associated speech and language challenges, so children can find it difficult to access the, the curriculum and the learning if the language is presented in too complex a way. Okay, thank, thanks very much, Charlotte. Um, apologies if you were having any sound difficulties there, but we will um, come back to some of those answers in a little while. In terms of the different summaries of behaviours in terms of dyslexia, dyscalculia and autism. Obviously, there are some cues in front of you and also some uh, definitions, official definitions. Um, just turning back to you, Lucy, just to begin with, in terms of initial support that you might encourage parents to either seek out or to put in place themselves. If, if you were working with a dyscalculic child or you suspected they were dyscalculic what would you tell your parents to uh, put in place just initially just to um, instigate some further information I think the first things I do be um, start conversations if I was a parent who's concerned don't sit on don't sit on those worries um, 
talking to teachers at school, um, talking to other parents even is a good start to see whether you're get a sense as to whether your your child is really struggling or whether they're just just a bit slower to catch on to things. Um, if you at that point think actually, do you know what? There's something going on here, and I'm not happy about it. I would look at having a screener done. A screener just initially puts you gives an overview of where your, the child is um, in all terms. Um, so you'd have a, a cognitive aspect of it to look at short term memory and processing speed. And then I would do a really comprehensive um, maths assessment with the child that was very structured and went through all the concepts that they should be learning at the age and stage they're at, with a focus on getting the child to talk and speak through exactly what their thought processes are. Because quite often a dyscalculic child will find odd ways to do things. They might eventually come out with the right answer, but they've come about it in a very strange way and it's not a sustainable method um, and that's why they start to to come unstuck in their maths so it's really important to find out um, their thought their thoughts and their strategies that they're using so that's what a screener would do and that would give you a whole pile of information as to whether you just needed to put separate um, teaching in place and have some extra support in specific areas or whether you wanted to go further and look at the diagnosis. Thanks very much, Lucy. And Kelly, in terms of dyslexia, what are some of the early interventions that maybe a parent themselves could, could put in place just to further strengthen their sense of actually there's something not quite right before coming to a specialist like yourself? Yeah, so um, part of uh, the diagnosis of dyslexia includes um, that those difficulties have been resistant to high quality intervention. So even before you get to a sort of diagnosis, you want to have tried to intervene in some way. Um, and with dyslexia, because it's about reading and it's about spelling, you know, you want to kind of be targeting reading fluency um, in particular. You can't get away from needing to look at phonics. Um, and finally, you know, looking at uh, spelling um, and the best uh, the best support programs that you can find are multi-sensory that they work on reading and spelling using uh, images using sound using writing um, and even physically you know using um, letter blocks and things um, and the key thing you can do at home is repeat you know do things little and often do three or four spellings and then repeat them every day rather than tackling 10 in one sitting um, read little and often hear them read out loud you read to them, use some echo reading so that they can copy the intonation that you use when you read. Um, so try to put an intervention in place for a few weeks. And if you still find that there are questions that need answering, um, then uh, Lucy said it wonderfully when she talked about the screener for dyscalculia. I would say exactly the same. If you've got a young child, um, then you know, explore what's going on rather than get to that diagnostic stage. An older uh, child, so I would say probably over 11, you might want to look at the kind of diagnostic process um, because a report lasts forever. You don't have to update, especially the cognitive elements. You don't have to update them again once they're done. Thank, thanks, Kelly. And so moving on to screening and diagnosis, which we've been talking about quite a bit, um, Charlotte, just by way of your expertise, what would an initial screener look like in real terms? What would the experience be like for the child themselves and also for the parents if they decided to go down the screening route? Okay, so looking at gathering as much information from many different environments that the child is experiencing and possible. So the screener would include a questionnaire for the school to gather as much information as possible from the surface and the child to understand what may be challenging them. An interview for parents to understand more broadly about how the child manages in their day to day life. And also, if possible, an interview with, with the child themselves to understand what the challenges they are facing and how they are interacting with them. Thanks. Thanks, Charlotte. And Lucy, in terms of dyscalculia, what, what would a screener in your space look like for the child and for the parents? What, what would the experience be? 
Um, the younger children, I'd hope it would be face to face and it would be a series of, of questions that would focus on the, the kind of concepts that they should at their age be expected to understand. Um, and it would look at the strategies they've used to get to the answers they're getting to. So you would be assessing as much what they know as how they're getting to what they're getting um, to address some of the misconceptions that might be going on. Um, children are quite good at masking problems because they learn very early on. They don't want to be the one who's, who's not answering things properly. So a, a screener would be picking out whether the specific in issues, whether they're general issues, whether they're memory problems or strategy problems, just to start un unpicking what's going on. Um, and then you can go from there to see you know, how significant you think the issue might be, because it could be there's one or two general misconceptions that need addressing, and those can be done through specific targeted teaching rather than um, anything more significant than that. Or it might be that, that you need to go further, but it's an information gathering thing, but not so much on attainment, more on methods, I'd say. Okay, Th thank you very much, Lucy. And so the step from screener to full diagnosis is obviously quite a big one. And Kelly, you've obviously had experience of diagnosis in, in your space and in, within dyslexia. Um, how different is it obviously from a screener and, and what does it actually entail in terms of your, your experience? Uh, so the um, the kind of setup of a, a screener, the beginning, the initial setup of a screener and a full diagnostic assessment will be very similar. It starts with gathering information from the school, from the parents um, and, um, as Charlotte said, from the child themselves um, to just start creating a picture or, or a profile of, of that learner. Um, that is then combined with the um, assessment itself. And it's sort of in two parts. Um, the first is looking at cognitive ability. It's looking at memory processing. It looks at underlying ability. So, so how, what uh, visual and verbal skills does that learner already have? Um, and uh, it also looks at phonological skills, which is a key component of dyslexia but would be different to um, dyscalculia. Dyscalculia would also look at uh, memory and processing but wouldn't as much look at the phonological awareness. Um, the second half then looks at the impact so what are those cognitive skills or how are those cognitive skills being used to support reading, writing and spelling skills and that's where we're looking at okay so is the phonological awareness having a big impact on spelling for example or are there working memory difficulties impacting on how much they can process in one go and therefore they're not comprehending very well in reading. Um, so it draws it all together um, and creates a diagnosis um, and will conclude as to whether that person has dyslexia or um, processing difficulties um, or make onward referrals if it is perhaps um, um, a developmental coordination difficulty or dyscalculia. Um, the difference between a screener and a diagnostic assessment is um, a diagnostic assessment is um, written to a report format that is set by um, a standards committee in the UK. Um, and, you know, all uh, assessors who have a practicing certificate have to write to a certain standard. Um, and that enables us to give diagnostic um, a diagnosis which can last forever. So that's the sort of difference. Um, but they both would end in a report and they both have loads of recommendations for both the school and for home as to how to support the child going forward. OK, thank you very much, Kelly. And just drawing the webinar to a close, I've got a question that will be relevant to all three of you. And I'll start with you, Charlotte, if, that, if that's OK. There's been a question in the question and answer channel around if I was an international parent, um, how do I know that the diagnosis is going to enable my child in a, a different country? And that's 
difficult because not all of you will have worked with international families. But if you could just think um, of an experience you've had with a child where screening them and or diagnosing them or both has transformed their school life and if you've been working with a child for a long period of time in what way has it transformed themselves as well so if we start with you charlotte can you just talk just in general terms without any specific names obviously of an example of a child and a family where your intervention has just made such a huge difference to their outcomes yes um a, a young student came to mind um who was in a mainstream secondary school um for her, for her education and managed very well in fact she um she a stars in all of her GCSEs with a top level result and she switched from that school to a different sixth form um to study for her A levels and her world just fell apart. It was a very, very challenging time for her. Um and there was sort of concerns around what might be causing those challenges. So she she went through the process of screening or ADHD and then referred on by myself to a professional who can get the full diagnostic assessment. She subsequently received a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, and as, as Kelly mentioned, part of the diagnostic report includes recommendations for how a child can be supported or young person can be supported in the school environment. Um, and they gave some, some very specific recommendations around um, how where she should be positioned in the classroom, the type of language that she needs to, to be used with her. Um, she was given a laptop, so she was able to use that in classes that we received with each other that could be set up for the learning. Um, and we also made an application for access arrangements for her all of the exams. So she was able to take those exams in a smaller room and she was allowed to the time to get the exams. Um, we're waiting for the results, but we're hoping that it has made a huge difference to, to, her, to her outcome. And in fact, her fixing experience became a very, very positive one after a difficult start for her. Thanks. Thanks, Charlotte. Kelly, um, what about you? Experience with a family where you have seen just a transformation? Uh, so I think um, I worked with some twins from year four um, right up until year nine. So that's kind of roughly aged uh, nine until about 13, 14. Um, and I've been really fortunate to keep in touch uh, with the family um, and know that both um, the twins uh had a really rocky time at school, found reading, writing, all aspects of literacy hugely challenging um, to the point where it was a question as to where they could go to secondary school um, because of their needs, you know, um, and it was decided um, where they would go and that was the right decision uh, for those twins. And it resulted in uh, them both achieving not only GCSEs, which was a question mark when they were in um, years four and five, um, not only achieving GCSEs, but also um, A-levels and going on to study at university. So um, I think what uh, the, the kind of the best thing for me in that was uh, looking at those uh, twins as individuals and identifying what exactly they needed, where that support was most pivotal, um, and then putting that support in place and, and making sure that the family, the school and I were all on the same page with what the support would look like and how it or what it would lead to. Um, and so that particular support, that individual approach, which I think is absolutely crucial, putting the student at the centre and then working around, um, enabled those twins to achieve things that weren't weren't sort of, you know, considered possible for them when they were kind of nine or ten. Thanks, Kelly. And Lucy, um, last but by certainly no means least of all, can you talk us through an experience you've had with one of your families? Yes, um, so I work quite a lot with um, students who have refused school or won't go to school, don't like school and have massive issues with going there at all. 
And there's one girl who um, I've worked with who um, had been out of school for a good year with huge mental health issues and lots of problems. And she just wouldn't attempt any maths. She wouldn't do any. She was, by the time she came to me, she was 15, but she wouldn't, she just wouldn't do any of it at all, let alone go to school. There was nothing was happening. And it was because she had such, such bad anxiety about school and maths in particular as well. So the work I did with her was a really, really tailored to her and her needs. It had to be incredibly gentle approach. Um, and we unpicked what she didn't understand and found there were some fundamentals that she hadn't got. So worked with her on that, really worked out what of the building blocks of maths she hadn't grasped along the way. And um, pleased to say that last month she actually went along and sat her GCSEs. We don't know her results yet, so we don't know quite how much of a success story it is, but she got there and we were fully expecting her not to manage to attend any exams at all. And she did. So I'm really chuffed with that one. Great. Success stories. Well, thank you so much to all of you, to Charlotte, to Kelly and to Lucy for today's incredibly informative and interesting, insightful um, journey through special educational needs and disabilities. Um, if you do have any questions and you're online today or watching this webinar, then please do direct them to Tess Wilkinson at henleyglobal.com. Or if you'd like to speak to me, please do get in touch through Tess. Lucy, Charlotte and Kelly are available for screeners and ultimately for diagnosis. If you do have any questions or you'd like to take this further, please do be in touch with all of us. This is the final um, Henley and Partners education webinar of this series. Thank you so much for joining us and you will be sent a copy of this video and you can also access any of the videos in the education webinar series on Henley and Partners YouTube channel. But from all four of us, thank you very much for joining us and we hope to see you again in the very near future. Thank you very much, everyone.